That is serrated. That. Yeah. You wouldn't want to get stabbed with that, would you? Is that a machete? Yeah, that's a machete. This is a nasty piece of work. You don't get any easier at all. And, uh, and you have to try and be strong like every single day. It does kill you inside. Wow. My God. Look at that. I feel properly disturbed by this. I got convicted of GBH and possession of offensive weapon. When you have it, you feel like invincible. I'm Rosanna Allen Khan, doctor, mother, and member of parliament for Two Team. I've been meeting people directly affected by Britain's continuing knife crime crisis. All right, everyone, welcome to the first episode of my new show, of course, called Buck the System. Uh, what you just saw is a little taste of what is to come in this episode. But first, some introductions for those of you who may be new to my channel. Uh, my name is David West. I am a Christian, a filmmaker, a libertarian, a father of three, a husband to a beautiful wife, Cassie West. And I'm starting this show to be a place where I can kind of share my thoughts on uh, different issues that are going on in the world, uh, talk about gun rights, uh, talk about uh, abortion is evil, uh, talk about gospel and my faith as a Christian, uh, and talk about movies. That'll definitely be something I'll do. Um, apologize, this episode is a little later releasing than I'd hoped it would be. I was trying to get it out by the end of last week, but I've been having some major technical difficulties. I have a uh, Panasonic G7 camera that I would like to be recording this on right now, but it looks like the Cam Link device that I'm using to hook it up to my computer is just straight up defective at the So while I work on getting that replaced, uh, in the meantime, I'm going to be shooting these episodes on a webcam. And uh, not ideal, but it still looks pretty good. Anyway, I don't want to uh, postpone too much because this is going to be a, a fairly long episode. We are going to be going through a 17 or 18 minute long documentary put out by the British news source Joe about the British knife crime epidemic. And uh, I think it is compelling evidence, not only that the UK is a Orwellian dystopian hellhole, but that gun control, uh, weapon control, just control never stops it's a constant forward march and people are always trying to exert more control over fellow man I, this video exemplifies this in ways that are truly hilarious and <laughs> uh, those of you who sympathize with me on the issue of gun rights uh, if you haven't seen this yet you're going to be astounded so um, let's get right into it let's watch this video and uh what it's all about this is Tooting, South London. My constituency, my home. In June 2019, a local young man, 18-year-old Shayon Evans, was stabbed to death. I'm here at his memorial to grieve another young life lost and to try and understand how this kind of violence keeps on happening in Britain. Shayon's cousin spoke to me after the service. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. Talk about how this continues happening in Britain. Britain has an incredibly low murder rate. I think their murder rate is right around one in a hundred thousand. Um, in the United States, I think the only state that comes close to that is New Hampshire, which I think has a murder rate of almost identical, like one or 1.1 1 .1 per hundred thousand. The UK might be a little higher. Maybe it's like 1.4 per hundred thousand. I have to look it up. It has one of the lowest murder rates in the first world. So this idea that like, Oh, why does this keep happening? You can't stop every crime, but th these people will use any excuse. This just shows they will never stop. It's always going to be, oh, well, how do we stop this? How do we stop this? How do we stop this? We're talking about a country with, what, 60 or 80 million people? There's going to be some crimes. There's going to be some murders. You just have to expect that. My mum just called me and went, oh, have you heard the news? And I was like, what news? And she just was silent. And I just knew then that something really bad had happened. And they opened the tent. And you couldn't see him, but you could just see all the blood. And there was so much blood. And my cousins were convinced that it wasn't blood. They're like, oh, that's too much blood. That can't be, it has to be, he's like a red jumper. And I'm trying to say to them like, no, like that is, that's him. I expected that I was gonna lose someone in my family. I've lost so many, like we've lost friends and so many of my cousins have been stabbed and so on. That's what really broke my heart. Okay, we, we gotta talk about this for a second. This is kind of a running theme throughout this video. It is 
you know, I don't want to make too much light of someone dying. Uh, anytime someone dies, even if they're a criminal or a truly awful person, they are an image bearer of God. And that is tragic. And, you know, we shouldn't be happy about that. We shouldn't applaud that. Um, but there's this recurring theme throughout this video of they're like, yeah, these people just died. These people just got stabbed. People are getting stabbed left and right. And uh, I, I don't think it's victim blaming at all to point out that these people are almost certainly criminals most of the time. We're clearly talking about gang violence here. People do not just get randomly stabbed left and right. If you, you know, if you were talking about how tragic it is that you know you you had one cousin who got stabbed and murdered, who was walking down the street and someone stabbed and murdered him, that can happen, and that's a real tragedy. Um. In, in this respect, I kind of have a, a, a tiny bit more respect for like American gun rights activists who, or gun rights, anti-gun activists, I should say, who are talking about how terrible mass shootings are. Because with mass shootings, that really is just random people getting gunned down who are going about their day. When you can sit there and say, so many of my cousins have gotten stabbed, newsflash, your cousins are all in gangs. I, there's, you know... There's just kind of no way around that. And I'll, I'll talk about this more as the video goes on. That I realized then it was a shock, but also it was kind of like, well, how could I have expected better? I see this on the news every day. Why did I think I would be so blessed that this wouldn't happen to my family? So how many people do you know, you personally know of, in your wider circle, your family, your friends, who have been stabbed? I couldn't count. It would take, I'd have to sit and think about it. <laughs> so... Like I said, she knows all these people who have been stabbed. Um, in America, which has four or five times the murder rate of the UK, you know, I I don't, I can't think off the top of my head of anyone who's been that I know who's been murdered by a gun. I've known people who've committed suicide. I've known people who've accidentally, you know, shot themselves. I don't know anyone who's just been like m murdered, you know, close to me. Apparently, this woman knows a lot of people who've been stabbed and at least one guy who's been murdered i think sounds like she has more people who've been murdered this is clearly just she knows a group of people who are mostly in gangs um and i know there's going to be like the worst elements of both the left and the right that would seize on what i'm saying here uh because obviously the girl in the video is black um no being black does not mean that you're a gang member it doesn't make you um inherently more inclined to be a gang member uh, so honestly, like the, the identity politics, leftists and the racists on the right, you guys can just both piss off. There's no way of knowing how many people are out on the streets with knives. But one man in Leytonstone is taking action in his community to try and disrupt the wave of deadly violence. By t Hold on, that guy. I just think this is hilarious. This, the, um, let me go back and see if I can see what that says. This guy's T-shirt says... <laughs> Oh. But one man in Leytonstone is taking action in his. This guy's t shirt says, More police, <laughs> less knives. Um, I think that's hilarious. Like, the, you know, more police are going to be the answer. It, it's just really funny because, you know, here in America, um, especially probably the majority of black people like this guy is, would, would not want more police. I certainly don't want more police. Um, I don't know, this, that's just hilarious to me. More police, less knives, good grief. Community to try and disrupt the wave of deadly violence by taking the knives away from the streets. Amnesty bin. So um, if you know anything about gun control in America, I'm sure you've heard of gun buybacks. Police uh, work with either cities or uh, nonprofits usually to put on gun buybacks all the time. Uh, I have... This SKS here I actually got for 100 bucks when I crashed a gun buyback. It's one of my uh, better buys. I've, I've bought dozens of guns, uh, most of which I've then sold or fixed up, a few I've kept, um, at these gun buybacks where people are turning in their guns. And it's, oh, turn in your gun, and uh, there's no questions asked, just get rid of it. They're doing the same thing with knives now in the UK. I mean, I don't think this is a buyback. I think it's just a bin where you can drop it off and get rid of it. But, like, the people who... People on the left who are not like completely in favor of getting rid of the Second Amendment and banning guns always act like, no, no, we're reasonable. We just want to ban 
these scary assault weapons. We just, you know, want to ban the guns that you don't need. We don't care about banning your hunting rifles. We don't care about banning other stuff. Uh, and that may be true in the here and now for them. But the fact of the matter is, as soon as that's banned, those same people will eventually start supporting other bans. And it, it just never stops. Like, we're looking at it right here. Now there are knife amnesty bins. This is ridiculous. I'm in East London today to meet Courtney Barrett. He has set up Binning Knives Saves Lives, which is an incredible knife amnesty where people can come and drop off anything that they believe could be it's used gonna start as getting a deadly really weapon. Funny soon. He's kindly agreed to show me some of the knives. <laughs> oh man, uh, this is not the first time I've seen this video, but it still makes me laugh super hard. Um, if if you guys had seen me record this the first time I had watched this video. It would have just been like five minutes of me doubled over laughing here. These are almost all kitchen knives. Um, like the fact that they're playing this like dramatic, you know, thriller music sounds like it's from you know, the Born Identity or something. As, as they're looking at these knives, like this video, if this was made in America, nothing would be able to convince me that it wasn't a uh, parody or satire. The only reason I'm, I know this is sincere is because it's made in the UK and this is an actual British politician in this video. This is, I mean, this is like a joke. These are just kitchen knives. Are people not supposed to use kitchen knives in the UK? I mean, they literally have legislation. They try to, some politician tries to push through every year uh, to get kitchen knives removed. They've had chefs come in and testify that, um, points on kitchen knives aren't actually all that necessary it's this is what happens when you let them take the guns eventually they start going after your kitchen these knives. are all the knives we've got in less than 34 hours there's uh, around 220 230 something like that this is quite clearly it just says cheese on it yeah <laughs> i mean this one could do you a lot of damage, though. It, it really uh, could. This one it's looks really like old. crappy steak. Oh, it's actually cool. got um, hallmarks on it. But that, that is serrated. That's, that looks like a bread that knife. Is. You wouldn't want to get stabbed with that, would you? Is that a machete? <laughs> yep, that's a machete. Uh, this is a nasty piece of work. Um, no one in this country would have any need for this. No one in this country would have any need for this. Apparently, no one in the UK uh, lives in the countryside. No one in the UK ever has to deal with brush. No one in the UK ever has to hack down, uh, you know, brambles and berry bushes. Like this is this is so ridiculous. This uh, a really common theme that you see in a lot of uh, anti-gun or in this case anti-knife propaganda is this idea that nobody needs this. Nobody needs this. Nobody needs this. Um, yeah, people need machetes. They were invented for a reason. There's parts of the world where everyone basically owns a machete. Why are, are these people just completely unaware of the fact that there are vast swaths of people that live completely different lives than they do? Like this dude is clearly an, an urbanite. He lives in a city. Yeah. Okay, fine. You don't realize that people need a machete. A lot of us do. Like, would you look at an axe and say, oh, people don't need an axe? Like, are you unaware of the fact that some people only heat their houses with wood heat? It's close-mindedness of epic proportions, uh, which is hilarious because these people always act like the pro-gun or pro-knife people are, are the close-minded ones. It's just objectively not true. This is what you cut through the jungle from with. This one here. Oh, this is what you cut through the jungle with. So maybe you admit that some people would need it. I mean, UK is not the prettiest country in the world, but there is vegetation there. It wasn't actually dropped into our bin. No, it's got a. <laughs> this is like inside. something that somebody would so buy at a we was at a flea market and, and, and have it. hanging on their wall. Like um, most of the stuff the is couldn't make junk. It to the bin, so I went and collected it just beforehand. Wow. Um, I wonder if this would have been on someone's wall. Yeah, I think exactly. it's a decorative thing, but yeah. these are the kind of things we're trying to tell people you don't need them in your house because these are the things people, yeah. people get in an argument and come and grab them. The kids might be scared because they've been picked. It's like these people are unaware of the fact that there are other weapons in the world besides knives. I mean, if, if the UK ever gets to the point where there just basically aren't knives, which I don't even know how that's possible. I mean, as you can see, most of these are kitchen knives. Knives 
it's impossible really to cook without a knife. Um, I mean, you certainly can't do much work with meat or anything. Can't cut bread. But like, is there going to come a point where we're watching a video called <laughs> Britain's lead pipe crisis and they're wondering why do all these gangsters, uh, or excuse me, they never call them gangsters. Why are all these harmless young lads carrying around uh, 18 inch lengths of pipe? What on earth are they doing with this? Tom by a gang or whatever, you know, you don't know. I think so often people think that, that larger knives do more damage, but that's not the case, is it? Um, well, to be honest with you, uh, my, my point of view is that the smaller the knife, the more prone the, the person who's doing the stabbing oh. is to stab repeatedly. I love that they admit that the small knives are actually the ones that people are more likely to carry and use in crimes, but they still do all the fear mongering with the machete. Like no one needs this. No one would ever, ever need this tool. That's completely impractical to conceal and carry around. Um, so smaller blades can be more dangerous really because they, they, they're used more. I've heard that a, a large proportion of knives used are actually kitchen knives. Yeah. Um, around about 70% of knives <laughs> used in knife crime are kitchen knives. 70% of knives using knife crime or kitchen them. knives. I mean, guys, if this isn't proof that people will just... you know, Maybe maybe by banning guns, you will lower the murder rate a little bit. But people are just going to go on to other weapons. Like this, That's an objective reality. So why are you going to screw over so many innocent people in your pursuit of an impossible goal that leads to just so much authoritarian nonsense. Facts and figures and that. A lot of people just think knife crime is just to do with gangs and on estates and doesn't concern them. You know? but I mean, yeah, because it, it does happen to gangs. You. It can happen to anyone, any place, any time, you know. They say this, but I swear to you, if you watch this whole video, everyone they talk to about knife crime is like, yeah, I was always carrying a knife. I, I knew all my mates who'd been knifed, and uh, oh, I didn't want to get knifed myself. They're not talking about people who get randomly attacked with knives. This is overwhelmingly a gang violence problem. I mean, it could not be any more clear. Anyone could be affected. Yeah. And anyone could be carrying a knife. You yeah. don't know. That cracks me up. This is another thing you're going to see throughout this video. Is they're, they're always talking how weird it is to carry a knife. I mean, like, spoiler alert. I'm sure it doesn't surprise you since I'm in a room of guns, but... Uh, this is the knife that I'm carrying right now. I've carried this for the last three or four years. Before that, I had another knife. Um, it's, there's nothing weird about carrying a knife. Like, I live in Oregon, which has... Uh, we have quite a few, like, liberals and hippies here. And just because of where we live and the culture, even a lot of, like, just, you know, comical cartoon SJW types will have a pocket knife. It's not weird. So this idea of, like, that it's so strange to carry a knife, just, again shows that these people are so myopic and so um, unaware of the fact that anyone around the world leads a different life than they do. It's, it's hilarious. So with all those knives, what are you going to do with them? Um, basically, we're going to make a statue with them. Um, we've got um, Black Horse Metalworks who have agreed to make, uh, melt the knives down. Um, and we're going to commission a youth group to make a statue with them. Wow. Um, the statue will be dedicated to everyone that's been murdered by a knife in London in 2019. Um, I've got a diagram here oh, on yeah, my phone please. somewhere. Oh my um, god. Say there's 140 deaths this year. Yeah. It's 140 love hearts oh. making one big love heart. Yeah. On a plinth with all the dates and names, etc. Yeah. The majority of the weapons Courtney has collected are regular kitchen knives that you'd find in any home. But there is a darker world of. <laughs> This kind of crap is clearly just what you would buy at like a like a truck stop or like a really really sleazy little place. These really aren't even like nice things. Again, it's like, oh yeah, you know, we know the little knives are the ones that are um, the most dangerous, but we're gonna pull out this 14 inch long, stupid fake like ninja sword and uh, use it for fear mongering purposes. Knives out there, knives that aren't meant for cooking. This really is just, it's the exact same mindset that you see uh, here in America, where people will always be, you know, uh, uh, pulling out uh, assault weapons, AR-15s and AKs and the like, and saying, look how dangerous it is, we want to ban this. Um, and not even addressing the fact that those guns account for, on average, around 2.5% of all homicides in America, whereas 
handguns, uh, which most anti-gun people view as much more mundane, at least today, handguns used to be the cause celebrate of the anti-gun movement, but Heller versus DC put a kibosh on that when they pretty conclusively declared that a handgun is a uh, universal constitutional right. Um, but, but they're always fixating on these assault weapons and ignoring the fact that like 50 or 55 or so percent of all homicides are committed with handguns. It's the exact same thing here. They bust out these scary knives because if they were focusing on the fact that apparently 70% of all knife murders are committed with uh, kitchen knives, people will just laugh at them. They're incredibly easy to buy. Several kinds of knives are illegal to sell in the UK. Knives like butterfly knives, flick <laughs> knives, even knives disguised as other objects. Though they're this illegal is a stupid to sell, little Transformers how hard bracelet knife and we're supposed to be scared of, of it. I decided to try and find out and went to a well-known online retailer and with a few clicks of a button, I was able to get some from China. This one's got a transformer face on it. This knife is very clever. This is disguised as a bracelet for all you transformer fans. It's got the face of a transformer on it and the blade is inside there. <laughs> Look at that. You could put it's it on like your wrist. It's like an inch and a half long. Clip it. Well, flick it open very quickly and use it. Yeah, but can you though? Like, what are you going to do in a crime? Like, you're oh, flipping around and now you're holding this little tiny blade with no real handle. It just has like some paracord in it. This is the kind of stupid little survival tool you would see someone selling at like a, like a gun show. Like, oh, you have 25 feet of paracord and a, and a one inch and one and a half inch blade for an emergency. This is not an effective weapon. This is not something you could get out quickly. You could more, I mean, like this is sure you could like, if you had someone held down or you snuck up on them, maybe you could like slit their throat or poke them with this. I, I promise you it would be easier for a grown man to do serious damage to someone just running up and punching them in the face than it is using stupid little garbage knife like this is it to do some serious damage it looks like it's at least an inch and a half long a lot of thought has gone into the engineering wow, the fact that with half. one hand you can you can release the blade and hold it and repeatedly <laughs> knife someone it's uh it's, it's frightening it's not gonna be very easy to knife somebody with a well. floppy little thing in your hand it does not have a handle oh my gosh look at this this is a butterfly knife my god i've always found this the, the really fear mongering angry. about butterfly knives really cracks me up like, there's even a lot of places in america where they're uh you know illegal to carry and it's like no one would ever bat an eye at me having you know this little columbia river knife and tool knife here but i mean i can flick that out there's a little awkward angle here but like, i can flick that out incredibly easily because when you're using a tool, sometimes you're holding something, you need to get it open with one hand. It's not about like being able to flick it open quick and knife somebody. It's a useful aspect of a tool. So I don't understand why people are so afraid of butterfly knives. They're honestly not the most practical type of knife at all. I'm angry knowing that our kids can be out there buying <laughs> this and we think they're safe. This is the, this is the tip of the iceberg. Thin <laughs> package. <laughs> This is a credit card knife. I'm not going to lie. I, f I feel a bit sick right about now because <laughs> I've just taken out a knife that looks like a credit card that could be in someone's wallet. This is so stupid. Any like you got to pull this out of your wallet it and fold madness. it up. Again, this is this one of those dumb like, like survival gimmick things. Common Garden Stanley knife. Oh, it's oily. Wow. <laughs> you can see it's really serrated and they're groups of three teeth. These can be bought and be available on our streets. It's, I'm just, I'm actually quite speechless. I'm not often speechless. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like the fact that they're this, uh, <laughs> this alarmed at these knives. I just wonder what someone like this would even think about someone like me who owns uh, dozens of firearms of fairly serious firearms um what do you they just need to get out more they need to get out of their bubble this is this is stupid but 
words <laughs> words fail me at the moment. These knives are all words designed fail me one because I saw a pocket to knife. kill. And as we know from the endless headlines, so many of those killed by knives are teenagers, kids. As a mother, as a human being, the idea of a knife being turned against a child makes me sick. I need to understand what losing a child to violence feels like and what it does to a family. I'm <sighs> this part is sad, you know? I mean, I feel for any parent. I'm a parent, I have three kids, I'm counting. Um, I feel for anyone that loses a child, but uh, this is pathetic when you see what they're doing. I'm on the way to Leicester to meet Amy Morgan. She's a mum who so sadly lost her son Tyler in 2015 after he was stabbed in the chest. She has turned her pain into power and has become a tireless campaigner against knife crime. Amy has joined other bereaved mothers in protest, taking action to try and stop more young people losing their lives to knife crime. The, the fact that they're all just going after the knives, just like everyone here goes after the guns, instead of the root issue. Again, like at least when a parent loses a child in a mass shooting, their child was a truly innocent, random victim of a heinous crime. I'm not trying to make light of people who die, but when people die in gang violence, which it is abundantly clear that most of these knife crimes are um, you got to recognize that they bear some culpability. In uh, you can't just say, oh, if there weren't knives, they'd be okay. Your kid could have gotten beat to death in a, in a gang. Like, you know, it's, there's always going to be something. It's the gang activity. It's the criminality that is the real issue here. And I get that you guys are all bereaved traumatized mothers who will never be the same again because you lost a child but uh if your kid was in a gang a lot of that's your fault and uh i get that it's easy to just try to pass off the blame but you shouldn't do that especially not with these laws that uh i'm positive i've heard a lot of innocent british people we met at the spot where <laughs> can you imagine getting murdered <laughs> and um, memorialized in Comic Sans. Tyler was killed. You know what happened down there that night? And then I guess in a way, I suppose your, your brain and your emotions are just trying to process everything. And I guess coming here kind of is part of that process, I guess. I just think that it's why I had his last moments, yeah. And then we had his plaque done in memory. Yeah. In loving memory, Tyler Thompson, your beautiful soul and your vibrant smile, taken too soon, gone but not forgotten, rest in peace, Tyler. 10th of April 1999 to 24th of the 11th, 2015. People forget, people don't care, people move on. People don't want it, you know, they don't want to remember it all the time, but to us it's so much special. Amy invited me into her family home. She told me about what happened the day her son died. Tyler was stabbed twice, in the arm and fatally in the chest. The doctor at the hospital said that where he'd been stabbed at the bottom of his heart, and that's why I couldn't do anything. And then I later found out he'd like a case of survivor. He drowned in his own blood or cardiac arrest, but it would have been really quick. But just like I think, I think to myself, like, you know, what were his last thoughts? Did he know? You know, did he think? Did did he? You know, did he want me, me there? And like, you know, it does it traumatise you like, like that that way. And what about the person that did it? Like, what? He'd already got caught carrying a knife, like about fourteen months before we killed Tyler. Um, and apparently had a caution and went on a knife awareness course. Right. On that evening, there was like a confrontation and Tyler and this individual had a fight and the fight had finished and Tyler got on his bike to leave 
and then he went up to him and stabbed him. Okay, so the way that her son died is there was a confrontation, some kind of fight. And then when the fight was finished, he was leaving and the other guy ran over and stabbed him, it sounds like. I mean, it's possible that her son, Tyler, just got in a, a random fight. Maybe he was justified. Maybe some guys were harassing him. He defended himself, beat him up, and went to ride off and then got stabbed. Maybe. But realistically... Judging by how most of these other crimes went, uh, again, it sounds like it was probably gang related. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that because he was black, but um, or even because he has a single mom, which is a huge. Uh, apparently, has a single mom. I guess I don't know that, but it sure looks like it. Um, which is obviously a huge contributing factor to juvenile delinquency. Um, I'm saying that because. People get into fights all the time. People get into drunken bar fights. Teenagers get into schoolyard fights that rarely, rarely, rarely end in someone coming up and stabbing the other person. That's not the way that a normal run-of-the-mill fight would escalate. If there is a gang fight and there are already you know, higher tensions and rivalries and a higher degree of criminality and... Um, you know, uh, just, just a higher degree of hardness to the people involved in the fight, that's a lot more likely to end in someone getting stabbed. So I just, I don't think it's very likely that this wasn't, you know, her son being involved in a lot of mischief and uh, criminality uh, and over the years and that kind of, you know, coming back to bite him. Um, Again, tragic that he died. Uh, a lot of people can have youths like that and go on to, you know, do something better with their lives. But why are we blaming the weapon here? You know, you're like, oh, well, the guy had already been arrested with a knife. And so if he'd just been punished more harshly or whatever, but, okay, how long are you going to lock someone up for carrying a knife and not doing anything with it? How much of an authoritarian would you have to be to be like, oh, well, that guy should have been locked up for a decade or, you know, his life. You can't do that. And even if there was no knife availability, even if they were scrutinizing this guy every single day, making sure that he did not have a knife in his possession, that would not have changed the fact that he was uh, clearly a hothead with a temper who attacked a guy who'd already had a fight with him. And if you're liable to... You know, if you're liable to stab somebody after you lose a fight or whatever happened, are you any less likely to pick up a rock and bash their head in or take a pipe to them? You cannot stop this. It's not about the weapon. It's about the people behind the weapon. He got um, sentenced to 11 years. He got a year off for being on remand. He got a year off for not putting his through a trial. And you'll serve half of that. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, this is insane. Is that this is saying that her her son's murderer got eleven years, got one off, and will serve half of that, and then get some kind of probation or something, if I understand correctly. Why are you out there fighting to you know do more about knives? Why aren't you focusing on that? That's a heinous miscarriage of justice. Like, I mean, I mean, at this point, like, what do you? What are people? What kind of punishments are people getting in the UK for carrying a knife? If you if you could get sentenced to a couple months for carrying a knife, but then only serve five or six years for murdering somebody, that's that's the real problem. It's not the knives. I got in touch with the general attorney to try and get him to look at the sentence again. Yeah, they said that locked Tyler up for a long was time. responsible for his own turned. death because basically they'd had a fight before the incident. Which is a bit of a more than a kick in the teeth. How can you be responsible for your own death? You know, he, he were not the one that was carrying the knife. You know, it's like all his 16 is, years. That kind of, of sentence might make sense if they'd gotten up a fight system. and he accidentally killed them by punching him and it was clear manslaughter, but hard. Really stabbing is, someone after a fight's all <laughs> I know. I mean, that's like premeditated murder at that point. You have to try and be strong like every single day. You know, you just break in inside because it does kill you inside. This is the one that was eight weeks old at the time. 
So he'll, he'll never get to know him, you know, that hurts. Though Tyler may no longer be with us, his memory is more than alive and the pain of his death more than real. Before I left... Yeah, I mean, again, I hate to... Um, I forgot this aspect of the video. I hate to, you know, be mean to a grieving mother, but people do need to take some responsibility in this. Like, instead of push lobbying for these laws that will result in innocent British people, peaceful British people who've done nothing wrong except for carry a knife that in places like America, everyone carries, um peacefully and without incident instead of instead of you know pushing for laws like that why don't you acknowledge the fact that um like you might have contributed to your child's delinquency you know that other child was obviously from a different um father than the other kid like this we're talking about a single mother in a rough situation i'm sure lots of things that are out of her control but it's you can't hurt other innocent people because of um because of crimes and because of things that you know their own failings contributed to amy showed me tyler's memorial video <laughs> Okay, super hot pie in the building. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's a beautiful young man. I'm so sorry. I need to do something because it's just relentless, isn't it? Yeah. What could drive someone to carry a knife, let alone turn it against someone? Thank God we're past the I'm sad part. Now community. on to the funny part. A I can make fun of this stuff with a lot more. At uh, risk young people direction and mentoring. I feel better about myself. I'm meeting two it. young men who can't be identified. This just, this cracks me up. This like hilariously ineffectual blur they're putting on here. Um, first of all, why are you blurring the back of his head? And uh, especially this ineffectually, like that doesn't conceal anything. Identified. We both carried knives. <laughs> I want to understand why they did it and what the consequences were for doing so. Can you tell me a little bit about your time in the criminal justice system? I got convicted for um, stabbing, stabbing someone else. I got convicted of GBH and the presenting of offensive weapon. A lot of people around me were carrying knives. I've got, I even got into, I've even got into fights and arguments with my own friends and my own, my own friends would pull out knives. And... Yeah, when everyone around you is carrying out knives and pulling them, uh, on people um that's not normal society you are involved in gangs i i don't know what happened but at one point it's like pride pride to me and it's like a lot of other people became more important with anything else no one wants to lose and what what made you feel first of all that you needed to carry a knife at, at that age even if you're going from where i was over like over, over one town there's people that if i said well i'm from junction you never know what's gonna happen guys why are we Knowing not addressing the fact this is clearly gang related me, i felt like i needed one to protect myself what kept on seeing happen i'm getting to fights and people are pulling out weapons yeah have you been stabbed um yeah Funny enough, it was by someone I know. What happened then? Made me a bit more wary. And I did actually start carrying a knife more after that. I got permanently excluded for um, bringing a knife to school. I was being approached by other like groups of young people. And then when I told the school, they didn't do anything about it. I wouldn't do anything with it, but I just thought like it might scare them. So, and then they would leave me alone. Oh, so it sounds like public education is also to blame. When you have it, you feel like, in a way, invincible, like nothing can happen against you. And it just you know, gave me a sense of power, in a way. Do you think you'd ever carry a knife again? No, I haven't since, and I don't think I would again. In London, oh, the City Hall has come under fire for not doing up. enough to tackle the capital's growing knife crime problem. 
Sophie Linden is Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime. I challenged her to explain what was going on. There's lots of complex reasons for it's happening, but one of the really big issues for me is the nine years of cuts to uh, the services that help young people and families. There's lots of complex reasons that are happening, but let's talk about what welfare cuts and um, <laughs> and the knives themselves. Sure, okay, yeah. Let's not talk about um, the general problem of gang violence sort of glue to society that keeps people together. Youth clubs have been shut down, schools have had millions of pounds taken out of them. So anybody that needs any little bit of help finds it incredibly difficult to find it yeah. and to get it. And the youth clubs shutting down and those programmes means that it's not things for young people to do. And then of course we've also had an increase in drug dealing and there is a real link between drugs and violence. Oh, that's the closest we've got to an acknowledgement of the fact that um, gang violence is really the root cause here. This is these people are retarded. So it's really complex. So there are people that are critical of the Mayor of London mm. saying he's not done enough. It's then. not just in London that violence has been rising in the Home Office research and you can see that it's across the country that we've got violence rising and it started in 2014 mm. which is long before the Mayor became you know got it became Mayor of London. He's put millions of extra money into the police to really get on top and suppress the violence and he's put Violence just kind of naturally ebbs and flows in the world. We go through periods of unrest and uncertainty and periods of peace. I mean, America's crime rate has been plummeting for decades. The murder rate bottomed out around like 4.5 per 100,000 a few years ago. And it looks like now it's kind of going back up again a little bit. Uh, this is just this is happening all around the at least kind of Western first world. And... It's obviously very complex. You know, who knows exactly what the issues are, but it, like it, you got to just recognize at some point that thing. You know, trends come and go, and it's not always something that we can control. And often, by but trying to, to control it, we make it worse. To the Young Londoners Fund, what? What can be done to really tackle the issue? Putting extra money into the police so that they can catch those that are perpetrating the violence. But really, really importantly, we're putting more extra money into community Always comes organizations, down to extra money into the into police for these organizations, people. youth clubs, so that they can work with young people. By the end of 2019, hundreds of people will have lost their lives to a knife in Britain. Together in 2020, we can put an end to it, but it's not going not to be can't. down to the government and police alone. Communities, activists, victims, family, friends and ordinary people need to stand together to say no more. For every Tyler, for every Shayon, for every life needlessly lost to a knife. Alright, so that was that. Um, like I said, pretty funny. I'll put the link to the original video at the bottom if you want to watch it kind of without my commentary. But um, yeah, tell me that doesn't sound exactly like the gun grabbing American left just with the, you know, control F search performed and find and replace assault weapon with knife. It is the exact same mindset. It's the exact same arguments the exact same problems and logical inconsistencies with those arguments. Um, gun control never stops. It is a constant forward march. And this is why, you know, if you're someone who's nominally pro-gun or even pretty pro-gun, even if you're just like, you know what, um, I all I want are background checks. And you look at people like me and think we're crazy when we say, no, we can't even do that. You're like, well, it's, it's, it's reasonable. How much is a background check going to affect you? Me personally, a background check won't affect me very much. It doesn't really affect me to have to wait, you know, an extra 30 minutes at a gun store. That's about how long it takes here in Oregon to get a background check. The extra $10 fee doesn't really hurt me. Um, you know, it, I can pass a background check easily. Uh, but I mean, not everyone can. There's people who maybe have an unjust conviction for marijuana or something that now can't own a gun. And yeah, that definitely hurts them and their rights when you have those background checks. But honestly, even bigger, bigger picture than that, background checks are a step towards what the UK has. Every little step towards that, you know, th there's this Overton window that's constantly being shifted either towards more gun freedom or just more freedom in general or more control, more uh, abridgments of our gun rights. 
that's what happened in the UK. At one point in the UK, you know, I don't know when they started getting so anti-gun. I, I, I want to say it was like the early 20th century, late 19th century. But at some point, at one point, they were able to own guns. And then that just got eroded, eroded, eroded to the point it's at today. Do not for a second think this couldn't happen in America. I mean, I kind of don't think it could happen in America at this point because we managed to cling to our gun rights for so long that they're impossible to take for us. I mean, I look at how many people I could outfit. I have tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition and, um, you know, dozens of firearms. Uh, I, it's going to be very hard to get to that point in America, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. I don't think we're, you know, going to be there in a decade or two. I think it would take decades and decades. And again, it might be next to impossible for that to happen in America at this point, but that doesn't mean we need to stop being vigilant and on the lookout for it. You know, like, like FUDs are some of those FUD is what we was you know, like Elmer FUD. It's what we would call someone who, thinks, oh, you know, I'm, I'm pro-gun, but really all they support are like hunting rifles. And they scoff at people like me who would own uh, lots of handguns or lots of AR-15s or whatever. So those are some of the most dangerous people to gun rights because they're exactly how you get to that point. They, you know, you ban these scary things and then they want to ban, next I want to ban my bolt actions. Um, that's obviously what's happened in the UK. I mean, they they really have pretty effectively to some extent. I mean, there obviously are guns that still get on the streets. Even in that video, I think there was one like handgun, maybe two or three that you saw sitting in the knife collection bin. They obviously get there, but not anywhere near the numbers they are in America. So to some extent, the UK has been successful in getting guns off the streets, but they've just moved on to something else. They've just moved on to another form of control. And I, I certainly don't want to live in a society where you are being hassled about buying kitchen cutlery. I don't want to live in a society where I can't carry a knife. I use my knife all the time. You know, I, I carry uh, I carry a handgun every day, and then I carry a flashlight, and I carry a knife. I use the flashlight the most. I use it literally every day to shine on stuff. I use the knife second most. I, I never hardly have to draw my gun. Um, but my my knife, I'm constantly, you know, opening boxes, cutting strings off my kids clothing um i'm trying to think of more like 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 the more the more really utilitarian purposes are, are more kind of few and far between but you use it for little things every day this idea that no one has a need for a knife it's ridiculous but that's where we will get if we let people convince us that oh you have no need for an ar-15 if we let people who live in the city who have never had to hunt a varmint or uh, you know, kill a bear that's getting into their garbage can or, um, you know, kill a mountain lion that's stalking them in the woods, all things that me and my family have done over the years. If, <laughs> if we let people convince us that we don't need guns for those reasons, eventually we'll get to the knives. And then eventually the UK will move on beyond something with the knives. I mean, they're basically to the point where I don't know where you go from knives at that point. What does it get down to? Just more really, really Orwellian stuff, like, um, you know, more surveillance, more tracking of people, more having to know people's whereabouts and stuff. It, we can't let people control us in any way. Anyway, I'm kind of just ranting at this point. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you guys had fun. Uh, I'm gonna uh finish out this video and then head over to uh, my family's house for. Uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. I hope you guys have a wonderful Christmas. I hope that you know uh, what Christmas is all about, celebrating the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I will be back later this week, hopefully, with uh, another episode. Uh, that one's going to be a lot of fun. It should be my um, sort of uh, walkthrough of a rather hilarious atheist review of uh, my... Um, my Pilgrim's Progress film that I made for my church a couple years ago. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, hope you guys have a great Christmas. Enjoy your families. And um, yeah, remember what it is all about. Take care.